Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and this is the Analysis.News. In the last few days, the Washington Post released excerpts of a book soon to be released, written by two Post journalists that, amongst other things, says the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff compared Trump to Hitler and warned of a Reichstag moment and an attempt at a coup. I've been saying for months now that the events of January 6 were supposed to be the final act of what turned out to be a failed attempt to stop Biden from being confirmed as president. The storming of Congress was to be the excuse for a military intervention that would then call for a new election. I pointed to many reports in mainstream media that made the point that a coup was in progress, and until this book had been mostly ignored by mainstream media. From my reports, YouTube pulled down one video and then banned me from advertising on Google forever. I suppose they'll claim I was promoting a conspiracy theory. Now, what will they do? That the Washington Post says there was a conspiracy. Given these reports from the Washington Post, I thought I'd repost my original report, which I put up in February, and here it is. Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. YouTube has censored and suppressed my report of the events of January 6, and I'd like to know why. But apparently Google doesn't owe me an answer. They can promote or suppress whatever they please. I'm an experienced journalist and filmmaker. My documentary work has appeared on major television networks around the world. For 10 years, I was the executive producer of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's main current affairs debate show, Primetime Daily. I'm the creator and host of the analysis.news and distributed on YouTube, as well as a few other places. I posted a video on YouTube on February 7th titled, A Failed Coup Inside a Failed Coup. And according to this email I received from YouTube, it violated their policies. How? Quote, how your content violated the policy, content that advances false claims that widespread fraud, errors, or glitches change the outcome of the U.S. 2020 presidential election is not allowed on YouTube. In fact, the video said the opposite of that. The report's central theme was that the events of January 6th were the final act of a failed military coup attempted by Trump after his false claims of fraud failed in the courts. All the sources in my report were from mainstream news outlets like the Washington Post, the New York Times, and Time magazine. The video did include clips of Trump's speech on January 6th, where he claimed the election was stolen from him, but that was clearly to illustrate his role in inciting the crowd. I appealed the takedown to Google. So far, there's been no reply. Thinking that the Trump clips had triggered an algorithm looking for content calling the elections a fraud, I posted a new version of the story without any clips from the Trump speech. This video was titled, Trump's Treason and McConnell's Mayhem. This story included evidence that Majority Leader Mitch McConnell knew the mob's intentions and did not take measures to secure the Capitol buildings properly. YouTube has allowed this video to remain on the site, but when I try to promote the video with Google Ads, my entire Google Ads account was suspended. Now, Google policy states that a suspension takes place when there is an egregious violation of YouTube advertising policy. And what is an egregious violation? According to Google, quote, An egregious violation of the Google Ads policies is a violation so serious that it is unlawful or poses significant harm to our users or digital advertising ecosystem. Further down, Google says, given that egregious violations will result in immediate account suspension upon detection and without prior warning, we limit these cases to when such action is the only effective method to adequately prevent illegal activity and or significant user harm. Now, I've appealed this action to Google as well, and the appeal has now been reviewed and turned down. I've been banned 
from all Google advertising, apparently forever. I don't know how my report causes such user harm, unless the users are Trump, McConnell, and the corporate elites who would like the attempted coup covered up. Why did Google do this? That's the thing. Google doesn't have to justify its decision at all. So I don't know. They are a private company. They can do as they please. Whether this censorship is the result of a crazy algorithm or just as crazy human decision, this is the shape of things to come. Censorship by monopolies of the only public platforms available for independent journalism, at least on a scale to reach a larger audience. In the name of suppressing Trump's ravings, these monopolies will suppress anything they find objectionable. It's past time that YouTube and other such platforms are treated as public utilities with a democratic code of operation and publicly accountable supervision. The kind of censorship we're seeing here is really the tip of the iceberg of what's coming. The other big question is why isn't the attempted coup getting more attention in the news? Everything I reference in my piece is taken from major news organizations published before January 6th. There isn't a heck of a lot about the coup after January 6th. Is it perhaps because the coup attempt came closer to reality than I thought? Would investigating the coup attempt risk exposing a threat to civilian rule and the law that goes beyond a crazy Trump scheme? There is serious support for Trump in the rank and file and officers of the military. Many soldiers are members or supporters of some of the extremist groups that stormed Capitol Hill. Here's a quote from Admiral Stavridis, a former Supreme Commander of NATO, in a piece for Time magazine. Quote, As the massive and ongoing FBI investigation has shown, veterans, in brackets, and most shockingly, some active duty, members of the armed services were deeply involved at a level well above their numbers in the general population. Active duty and veterans make up about 7% of the U.S. population, and so far, about 14% of targets of the investigation arrested and charged have a military background. The Admiral continues, As banal as it seems, recruits should be carefully scrutinized for gang tattoos, especially those associated with Nazi and white supremacy groups. Once people are part of the service, our leadership must be ruthless in disciplining and expelling those who drift in this direction. End quote. But it's not just about support for Nazi and white supremacist groups. There's also been a lot of reporting on the extent of support for far-right evangelical and far-right Catholic religious movements, both at the rank and file and amongst the highest leadership level. These forces are part of a rising fascism that goes far beyond Trump. The attempted coup, and that's what the Financial Times called it on January 4th, needs a full investigation. Here's the video report that Google is suppressing. You decide why it's deemed so dangerous that I should be banned from advertising on Google forever. Now, of course, it doesn't totally hurt me that I won't give any more money to Google. That being said, it's pretty hard to promote anything on YouTube without those ads. And if this video gets taken down by YouTube, Please tell everyone to come to the website, theanalysis.news, and watch our work there. Go after watching this video and sign up for our newsletter. It may be the only way we can stay in touch with YouTube viewers. Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to theanalysis.news. Did Donald Trump attempt to organize a military coup against the Biden administration? The evidence suggests he did. If this is true, shouldn't he be charged with sedition and treason and not merely impeached? Did Mitch McConnell is the majority leader of the Senate and the person who is ultimately responsible for the Capitol Hill police deliberately allow the right-wing mob into the Capitol buildings? 
Did he know the intent of the rioters was to storm the buildings and create as much mayhem and violence as they could? Did he do this to discredit Trump after his military coup had failed? There's little doubt McConnell knew what was coming and did not take action to prevent the buildings from being breached by the organized leaders of the mob. There must be a serious and transparent investigation into what led up to the events of January 6th. Instead, the Democratic Party and the majority of the media are focused on what Trump said on the day and what they're calling the insurrection of January 6th. But the evidence suggests the riot was the final act of a failed coup. And if it had been successful, it was far more dangerous than what happened on the Hill that day. Here's some of what we know about the events leading up to January 6th. I'm sure this is only the tip of the iceberg as to what went on behind the scenes, but there's enough in the public record to demand a special investigation done with full public scrutiny. These, uh, this indictment on September 17th, six weeks before the elections, Steve Bannon appears on the Tucker Carlson show and calls for a war starting on November 4th after the Democrats, quote, steal the elections from Trump. Carlson is, of course, nodding his head in agreement. There should have been no surprise with what happened after November 3rd. It was all planned in the open. The Democratic Party has traumatized their base. They're not going to come out to vote. And so somehow they have to concoct a, some effort to steal this election because they're not going to get people to come out and vote on game day the 3rd of November of this year. And that's what I've been I, working I, on for the last couple of months. I was never going back. I was never going back to the campaign. And that's where these guys messed up. My platform's bigger now. My voice is bigger. I've got more resources. And all we're focused on is to make sure that so, the progressive so I, left and the corporatists cannot steal, cannot steal the election from Donald Trump. I'm more focused than ever. We're kicking off a national tour on Monday called The Plot to Steal 2020. They're not going to stop my voice in assisting President Trump and making sure that this election that he's going to win on the third is not stolen from him. Huh. And then maybe the real contest begins. Steve Bannon, I'm glad that you came on. Thank you that's very when, much. That's when the war starts. I, I, Thanks, I'm, beginning to th I'm beginning to think that's true. Of course, Democratic Party voters did turn out, and much of that was by mail-in ballot. After November 4th, Trump calls the vote results stolen and a fraud and launches dozens of lawsuits challenging the results. The war is on. The majority leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, plays along, defending Trump's right to challenge the results. He later claims he was told that Trump would eventually concede. It's clear that the election results were not the result of widespread election fraud, and in many courtrooms, Trump's challenges fail. Even Republican legislatures confirm the results. Trump does not concede. And as we get closer to January 6, when Congress will certify Biden's election, Trump gets more desperate. Trump ally, retired General Michael Flynn, that is recently pardoned General Flynn, calls for military intervention and martial law on December 17th. In an interview on Newsmax, Flynn says Trump, quote, could order the within the swing states. If he wanted to, he could take military capabilities and he could place those states and basically rerun an election in each of those states. He continued adding, I mean, it's not unprecedented. These people are out there talking about martial law like it's something we've never done. Martial law has been instituted 64 times. The media pundits don't take Flynn seriously, and I got to admit, I didn't either. Trump puts enormous pressure on Republicans in Georgia in the state government to reverse the Biden win. He does this even though Georgia doesn't represent enough votes to change the results of the national elections. He's obviously desperate to get something to give his claim of fraud some validity. His January 2nd call with Brad Raffensperger, Georgia's Secretary of State, in which he repeatedly urged him to alter the outcome of the presidential vote in the state, goes public when Raffensperger releases an audio recording of the call. What else was going on in terms of Trump's contacts with the military? We don't yet know, but something concerned 10 former secretaries of defense enough to take an intervention seriously and issue a letter organized by Dick Cheney 
warning military leaders and the acting Secretary of Defense not to get involved in election results. There is an obvious concern that Trump's appointment as Secretary of Defense Miller is part of such a plan. In an opinion piece in the Washington Post, the letter of these former Secretaries of Defense stated in part, quote, As senior Defense Department leaders have noted, quote, There's no role for the U.S. military in determining the outcome of a U.S. election. Efforts to involve the U.S. armed forces in resolving election disputes would take us into dangerous, unlawful, and unconstitutional territory. Civilian and military officials who direct or carry out such measures would be accountable, including potentially facing criminal penalties for the grave consequences of their actions on our republic. The letter continues. Acting Defense Secretary Christopher C. Miller and his subordinates, political appointees, officers, and civil servants are each bound by oath, law, and precedent to facilitate the entry into office of the incoming administration and to do so wholeheartedly. They must also refrain from any political actions that undermine the results of the election or hinder the success of the new team. End quote. That's the letter from the Secretaries of Defense. In a show of further concern that a coup was being attempted, on January 4th, Admiral Stavridis retired, wrote an opinion piece to Time magazine in support of the letter from the 10 Secretaries of Defense. Stavridis is a leading figure of the military-industrial complex. He was the 16th Supreme Allied Commander at NATO and is an operating executive of the Carlyle Group, which is one of the largest private equity firms on Wall Street and is a major investor in several large arms manufacturers. Stavridis's letter in part stated, quote, The secretaries, here he's referring to the letter from the former secretaries of defense, he writes, The secretaries have been watching events closely for the past months, including the infamous presidential walk across Lafayette Square and well-sourced reports of discussions in the Oval Office of Martial Law. Even after they released the letter, the most recent reports of Trump pressuring the Georgia Secretary of State to, quote, find, end quote, another 12,000 votes could only have reinforced their views and sent a collective shiver up their spines. And it should... Nothing in our lifetimes is this more direct contravention of the oath of each of these cabinet secretaries swore to, quote, support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I suspect that these 10 leaders, urged by former Vice President Dick Cheney, in brackets, the highest ultimate office holder of the group, came reluctantly to the conclusion that they owed the nation their public voices. This is not me making this up. This is like... This is the admiral speaking here. But here's the bad news. None of them is in a position to do anything but raise their voices, as important as that is for the nation. The current occupant of the E-Ring office, meaning the Pentagon, is a retired Army colonel named Chris Miller, who lacks the experience, credentials, or independent temperament to stand up to a willful president. That is why the most important single statement of the past weeks has been the tweet from the Secretary of the Army McCarthy and the Army Chief of Staff McConville saying that, quote, there's no role for the U.S. military in determining the outcome of an American election. That statement was essentially a direct response to disgrace Lieutenant General Mike Flynn's public call for martial law and a redo of the 2020 elections. Fortunately, having the current Army Secretary and Army's top general directly and publicly denigrate such dangerous thinking aligns with other voices, including the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley. Now remember, that's a an admiral. That's the former uh, commander, supreme commander of NATO in, uh, in Europe. This is not me making this stuff up. But what is clear from these statements is that there was a danger, perceived at least by these very experienced military people, that acting Secretary of Defense was in cahoots with Trump, 
to carry out Flynn's insane plan of martial law. An attempted coup was in progress. On January 4th, the same day as the letter from the 10 former defense secretaries, the Financial Times editorial board says exactly that. Their editorial states in part, extraordinary as it may seem, what amounts to an undeclared coup d'etat is being attempted in the U.S. It will almost certainly fail, but the next two weeks will severely test the strength of America's institutions and the courage of its public officials. Again, that's not me. That's the editorial board of the Financial Times. The plan is now apparent. Trump would incite the crowd that rallied on Jan 6 to go to Congress, where the militants in the crowd were organized to storm the building. Bannon and others thought there would be similar riots in state capitals around the country. They expected acting Secretary Miller to order the military to intervene, declare martial law, and new elections. This was Trump's utterly delusional plan. It didn't work out. Acting Secretary Miller was rebuffed by most, if not all, the senior military leadership. Still, based on what's in the public record, Trump should be investigated, at the very least, for sedition and treason. Why this isn't the focus of the Democratic Party and mainstream media, I leave for you to conclude. Trump's coup had already failed before January 6th but the crowds were still on their way to Washington. They knew nothing of a coup, I assume, but are whipped into a frenzy by the far-right media. The organized militants are lusting for blood. Why didn't Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and the Senate Sergeant of Arms heed the warnings of the Chief of the Capitol Hill Police and the D.C. Police? There was a ton of other intelligence that the right-wing militants planned to storm the buildings. The sergeants of arms of the Senate has primary oversight over the Capitol Hill police, and he reports to Mitch McConnell, the majority leader. Why didn't they insist on a proper security perimeter? It could be made up of National Guard or regional police who were later called in. If they were so worried about the optics of all that, as we've been told, they could have hidden the guard in the basement tunnels under the Congress only to emerge when needed. This is common practice in such cases. When the military didn't play ball with Trump, Trump decides to call the crowd into action anyway. By now, he's delusional enough to think he'll emerge with a win out of the bedlam, knowing that millions of Americans believe he's been chosen by God, and as he once said, he could shoot someone in plain sight and wouldn't lose voters. Maybe he's thinking ahead and can't let his base see him as being weak or capitulating under pressure. The question has to be asked, though, by this point, did McConnell want the chaos to take place? McConnell must know by now the military's not going to intervene the way Trump hoped. By the January 3rd letter from the 10 former secretaries of defense, most of the financial and other elites were ready to dump Trump, as seen by McConnell, Lindsey Graham, and Vice President Pence agreeing to certify the results of the Electoral College. Trump had outlived his usefulness and was now seen as a liability. Does McConnell decide that the chaos can work for him? Even on January 6th, it appears McConnell held back. If there is any doubt about the chain of command or how McConnell responded on the day, here's a January 10th report from the Washington Post on an interview with Stephen Sun, the chief of Capitol Police, after he had resigned. The Post report states at 3.45 p.m., and let me add, by this point, the National Guard had still not been called. The Post report continues, Stenger told Sun that he would ask his boss, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, for help getting the National Guard authorized more quickly. Sun never learned the result. Again, ask his boss, Mitch McConnell, whether they can call the National Guard and the chief of police doesn't get an answer. Does McConnell think, after four years of eating Trump's excrement and pandering to his whims, that by letting the chaos reign and blaming Trump, McConnell will finally be rid of the Donald? Does McConnell see an opportunity to pry free the Republican Party from Trump's maniacal grip? Perhaps the most startling evidence of this coup against Trump now is that the Capitol was breached around 2 p.m. 
And at 3.34 p.m., the American Manufacturers Association, who had supported Trump for four years and received all the tax cuts and deregulation they wanted, only 90 minutes after the doors of Congress are breached, they issue a statement calling for Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment and remove Trump. 90 minutes after the doors are breached. How could the American Manufacturers Association do a turnabout so quickly? Was the plan to use January 6th to disgrace, weaken, and remove Trump in place prior to January 6th? And was McConnell in on it? Had Trump's insane refusal to peacefully transfer power threatened the investor's paradise that is the USA? Volatility is good for markets up to a point, but martial law and the overturning of American democracy, that's in quotation marks, was going too far. In the middle of the COVID pandemic and deepening crisis, the elites needed some rationality back in charge of the country. That is, after milking the Trump presidency for everything they could. Why there isn't more focus on McConnell may have something to do with the fact that it may open a can of worms for the Democrats. While the Senate sergeant at arms has the more senior duty, the sergeant at arms of the House shares responsibility for overseeing the Capitol Hill police and answers to Nancy Pelosi, the majority leader of the House. There are claims that Pelosi was lied to about security planning, but at the very least, shouldn't she have been more vigilant? Pelosi is just as savvy as McConnell. Did she really not know how weak the security preparations were? If the questions about McConnell are pursued as they should, there are some serious questions about Pelosi's role in all this too. Did the House Sergeant at Arms not keep her informed of the planning? Did he lie to her? This is what Acting Chief of Police Yogananda Pittman of the United States Capitol Police, and she's acting after the previous one resigned after the events of the 6th. Here's what she told the House Committee on Appropriations on January 26, 2021. This was a closed-door hearing. The transcript was obtained and then released by the New York Times. Pippin's statement reads, Let me be clear. The department should have been more prepared for this attack. By January 4th, the department knew that the January 6th event would not be like any of the previous protests held in 2020. We knew that militia groups and white supremacist organizations would be attending. We knew that some of these participants were intending to bring firearms and other weapons to the event. We knew that there was a strong potential for violence and that Congress was the target. Further down, she says, the Capitol Police, quote, adapted a new security perimeter based on instructions it received from the House and Senate sergeants at arms. Additionally, on January 4th, now that's two days before the events, Additionally, on January 4th, former USCP Chief of Police Stephen Sun requested that the Capitol Police Board, that's the two sergeant-at-arms primarily, declare a state of emergency and authorize a request to secure National Guard support. The board denied the request, but encouraged Chief Sun to contact the D.C. National Guard to determine how many guardsmen could be sent to the Capitol on short notice, which he did. End quote. Why did the two sergeant at arms deny the request of the Capitol Hill police chief? Clearly, a decision was taken not to include the National Guard in creating a more robust security perimeter. Are we to believe the Senate sergeant at arms took this decision without consulting Mitch McConnell? Remember, on January 6th, the Washington Post reported the Senate sergeant at arms said, that he couldn't call in the National Guard without talking to his, quote, boss, Mitch McConnell. Is it possible he didn't consult Mitch McConnell before the 6th? If this was a McConnell trap, why did Trump fall into it? Perhaps his megalomania, he couldn't let go of the moment to incite the crowd. Perhaps he was afraid his fascist base would turn on him if he didn't give such a speech. In fact, there are reports that the Proud Boys have now turned their back on Trump because he critiqued the violence and didn't give them pardons. Who knows what goes on in the mind of Trump? But step into the trap Trump did. 
Maybe Trump will have the last laugh if he's not charged with sedition and treason and if he's not convicted in the Senate and goes on to be a major power player in the GOP, maybe he ends up smiling. Why does Trump remain so powerful in the GOP even after these events? Because he represents the forces of rising fascism. As I've said before, he's the buffoon tip of a serious fascist spear. There's a mass base for Trumpism, just as there was for the racist and militarist Ronald Reagan. This is the truth that everyone has to face. The Wall Street-friendly policies of Clinton and Obama strengthen these forces. Will Biden be different? There are times the irrationality of capitalism is more fully revealed, where the shroud of American mythology is shredded by events. We are in such times. The storming of the Capitol buildings and the attempted coup was enabled by four years of big capital fawning over Trump's favors and nurturing his megalomania. Larry Fink, who runs BlackRock, the massive financial firm with $8 trillion under management and is a Democrat, said a couple of years ago that Trump had ticked off everything on Wall Street's bucket list. Combine that with their acquiescence toward Trump's criminal mishandling of the COVID pandemic and climate crisis denial. As I've said before, the billionaire class is not fit to rule. Will Trump and others, including members of Congress, be charged with treason and sedition? Will McConnell's role be investigated? Unlikely. That wouldn't support the myth of American stability, the shining beacon on the hill. Wall Street and the American Manufacturers Association wouldn't think that's good for business. Hell, coups only happen in the third world, not advanced democracies like ours. Mm -hmm.